Chapter six, sharing the road. Um, so the last five chapters presented important driving information that can help you develop your smart driving skills. The next three chapters will give suggestions on how you can apply this information to your driving. Knowing how to share the road is an important part of keeping safe when driving. In this chapter, you will learn who you share the road with and how to share the road safely with them. So in this chapter, we're going to be sharing the road with pedestrians, cyclists, motorcycle riders, passenger vehicles, large vehicles, school buses, public transit buses, emergency vehicles, emergency workers, construction, trains, and horses. <laughs> so sharing the road safely. At the scene of a crash, Walter is speeding along Pine Street in his van. He's in a hurry to turn left at the intersection before the light turns. He gets into the intersection and quickly swings into the left. Jody is riding her motorcycle along Pine Street in the opposite direction. She wants to go straight through and she has just enough time to make it before the light turns yellow. Jody assumes that Walter has seen her. The result is a crash that seriously injures Jody and sends Walter to the hospital with minor injuries. So again, being mindful of cyclists and motor um, bike riders, just because they do have less protection than we do in a car. And so we want to be extra mindful of not hitting them <laughs> because of course they're going to be more seriously injured than we would be in a vehicle. This situation happens a lot, um, especially in my area where someone wants to turn left before the light turns red and then someone runs it. If there's someone in the turning lane, I personally won't run it because I know for sure they have to turn before the light turns red, whereas I can always wait. So be aware of other road users who may want to use the space that you plan to move in. In this crash scene, both Walter and Jody tried to move into the same space at the same time. By law, Walter should have stopped for Jody before making his turn. But because he didn't see the motorcycle coming, Jody may have had the right of way, but she still should have looked carefully for vehicles in the intersection before riding through. Again, on a yellow light, typically nobody should be going through just because that is the rules. Um, as you will see, there is the way that things are meant to be done and the way that things are actually done. And um, so yeah, meant to be not running on yellows actually happens. Everybody runs on yellows. <laughs> when you're an N, I don't suggest it. <laughs> um, the way to avoid crashes is to make sure that the space that you plan to move into will be empty. To share the road safely with other with others, use your see, think, do skills. So just what we discussed in chapter five, see, think, do are your observation skills. You want to scan intersections from left to right and left again, looking for hazards. Walter started across the intersection without checking to make sure the road was clear. So since he was swinging into a yellow, just trying to make the light, he didn't have time to look properly. Um, if you don't have time to look, definitely don't go because like I said, people pop out of everywhere. See, think, do. When another road user is approaching the space that you are planning to use, you need to assess the risk and then choose the safest solution. It's also important to know the right-of-way rules. When two or more road users want to use the same space, right-of-way rules tell you which road user should yield. However, other road users make mistakes and do une unexpected things. It may not always be easy to decide who has right-of-way. If in doubt, always be ready to give right-of-way. To learn more about the right-of-way rules, go back to chapter four and review the rules of the road. So think about, think how you'd feel if you injured or killed someone while you were driving. What difference would this make to the rest of your life and who else would be affected? At the end of the day, I know if we're running late for work or the gym or just anything in general, we do err on the side of going faster. However, at the end of the day, like it said, how would it affect your life First of all, if you got in an accident, you're going to be late for everything in your day. Your car might get written off. Um, you may be hurt. Someone else may be hurt. In the long run, not running a light or just taking those extra few seconds can save you a lot of time and stress it for the future. So when we're doing, we want to watch our speed control and drive at a safe speed. This way we'll have time to stop if we need to. Again, um, I think I mentioned it previously, if I don't have to accelerate and I'm kind of in a weird position, I'll always just hover my foot over the brake. So if I do need to stop, I'm a little bit ahead of the game there. 
steering, you wanna keep both hands on the outsides of your wheel to maintain good steering control. Again, you can do a couple different variations. You can do the 10 and two, nine and three, or um, even the eight and four. Space margins, you wanna keep well away from other drive users, other road users. There will be less chance of space conflicts. You'll also have room to stop or steer around if others start moving into your space. So just keeping that two to three seconds um, or two to three car lengths in between you and other cars will really help um, troubleshoot if something were to come up. Communication, let other road users know what you are doing so they can react in time. Watch for communication from other road users. So typically this is a signal. Um, so if you see someone's blinker on, just be mindful to leave them space. Or if you're going into someone else's space, put your blinker on ahead of time. Other people may use uh, eye contact or hand signals as well. How to share the road. Next time you're stopped at a busy intersection, look around and count the different types of road users you see. You share the road with a number of different road users, including pedestrians, for example, children, people in wheelchairs, and traffic control people, cyclists, motorcyclists, drivers of passenger vehicles, large vehicles, for example, motorhomes and commercial vehicles, buses such as school and public transit, emergency vehicles, and trains. To use the road safely and to share the road, you will need to use all of your see, think, do skills. You also need to understand how different road users use the road. The following sections highlight some of the main points to keep in mind for each type of road user. So pedestrians, you always need to watch out for pedestrians. Like all road users, they can be unpredictable. You never know when a child may dash into the street or someone may step out from a park behind a parked car. Pedestrians are often hard to see, especially at night. The more you drive, the more you will appreciate people wearing high vis or just bright colors in general. There's been a few times where I'm driving down the road in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and I see someone in black walking on the shoulder and I'm like, oh my God, can you imagine if I was not sticking inside my um, space parameters? So it's always important to drive in the middle of your lane, even if no one's around, because sometimes there can be people that you totally miss. C, scan at crosswalks and intersections. Many pedestrians are unaware of the distance that it takes a vehicle to stop. They may suddenly step out into the street without warning. Anytime you approach a crosswalk or intersection, be aware of vision blocks. Do not pass if you see a vehicle stopped at a crosswalk. It's illegal and unsafe. The driver could have stopped to let a pedestrian cross the road. Um, sometimes people will stop also for animals in the road, so um, just being mindful that if someone stopped, there's probably a reason. So don't enter a crosswalk without checking to see that it's empty, even when the light is green. Someone may be trying to dash across. People who find it difficult to cross the road quickly, such as elderly people, people with disabilities, and parents walking young children, may still be in the crosswalk. Watch out for pedestrians on cross streets whenever you make a turn. So warning, crosswalks with flashing green lights are controlled by pedestrians. When you see a pedestrian standing near this kind of crosswalk, you know that they have probably pressed the button and the light is about to change. Slowly, sorry, slow down and be prepared to stop. Um, so yeah, those lights that just flash green constantly, they're usually triggered by pedestrians. Um, there's also new crosswalks popping up that are just strictly crosswalks and they have the big person crossing sign and it's white and it usually flashes as well. So we wanna pay attention in school zones and playgrounds. Observe carefully when driving in school and playground zones. Smaller children are harder to see than adults and are less predictable. As you approach a school zone at a time when children may be leaving, arriving, or taking their lunch hour, look well ahead for school patrols or crossing supervisors. You, may, you must obey them at all times. For details on speed limits for schools and playground zones, you can go back to chapter three and review signs, signals, and road markings. So when you see a school zone sign with a 30 kilometers an hour posted speed, slow down to that speed. The speed limit is in effect between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. on school days or on the hours shown on the sign. When you reach the back of the school zone on the other side of the street, you'll know that you've reached the end of the 30 kilometer zone. So usually say you're the red car you're driving. As soon as you see the back of this sign here, so probably about here, you can start to speed up to regular speed again. So you just have to maintain the speed between the two signs and then you're free to go. 
So we want to observe carefully in residential areas as well. Children and others may move in unpredictable ways. Remember, a ball or a hockey net can mean that children are playing nearby. Be especially careful if you're backing up. Check around your car before you get in it, and then do a 360 degree vision check before moving. It's important to continue checking because you could easily move back into a child or family pet if you're not observing carefully. Remember, this is where someone lives. So if you think about how you like act in your own um, neighborhood, you're usually more comfortable and sometimes you're not always paying attention. So that's why it's so, so important to be careful in residential areas. We also wanna watch for pedestrians with disabilities. Take extra care if you see someone who's visually impaired. They may be walking with a white cane or accompanied by a guide dog. Often they will raise their cane when they're uncertain about crossing the street safely. That is your signal to stop and give the person right of way. Don't startle them or their guide dog by raising your engine or honking your horn. People in motorized scooters or wheelchairs also share the road. Technically, they should be on the sidewalk, but not all roads have sidewalks. Also, sidewalks may be too rough or narrow to travel on or difficult to access. So for example, in downtown Langley, they're always doing construction. And so typically a lot of the older people on these scooters, if they're not aware of the construction on that street, they do have to drive on the street or they do run the risk of getting stuck in the construction. So that's always important to know. Driving tip. You must always be prepared to stop if you see a pedestrian that's about to stop, step out in front of you. But don't encourage jaywalking, crossing between intersections by stopping and inviting the pedestrians to cross. The car behind you may not be expecting you to stop and may crash into you. Drivers in the other lanes may not see the pedestrian crossing in front of your vehicle and may hit them. So, I mean, this is kind of a tough one because you want to like be nice and you want to let the person cross and sometimes you're like, oh, I'm not in a hurry. But like it says, it does encourage those people to continue to jaywalk and it might be safe one time, but it might not be safe all the time. So unless they are actually stepping out into the road in front of you, I typically just maintain my speed because they can always wait or they can walk to the crosswalk. You also want to watch for people in motorized scooters or wheelchairs traveling along the side of the road, especially when you're planning to make right turn. So this is where I was saying that that right um, shoulder check is so important before you make right turns just because there is always people or pedestrians on the sidewalk that you might have missed just by being in your blind spot. So we want to think. We want to know the rules. We must yield to pedestrians in a marked crosswalk if a pedestrian is close to your half of the road. At intersections, if pedestrians near your half of the road still have right of way even when there is no marked crosswalk. When turning, when entering the road from a driveway or an alley, and it's always the driver's responsibility to avoid hitting a pedestrian. So essentially pedestrians always have right of way in Canada, and if you hit a pedestrian, it is always the fault of the driver. Doesn't matter what they did. Speed control and space margins. We wanna slow down when we see a pedestrian who might enter your path and give them plenty of room. So, of course, by being a pedestrian, they also have their own rules. However, you will notice not everybody follows them. So strategies, being a safe pedestrian. Just as drivers need to carefully observe for pedestrians, pedestrians also need to carefully observe for drivers. You can make yourself safer when you're walking by remember, remembering a few simple rules. Do not leave the curb unless you are sure that the approaching vehicles on the cross street have stopped or will stop. Watch for vehicles that are turning. Always hold a child's hand while crossing the street until they are old enough to understand safety rules. Do not start to cross if the traffic signal is flashing, a warning, for example, an orange hand. Use crosswalks and don't jaywalk. Always activate a pedestrian's crossing signal if there is one. Cyclists. Cyclists commute to work as well as ride for recreation. So you can expect to see them on the road at any time of day or night. Be aware that bicycle riders have the same rights and responsibilities on the road as drivers. Observe carefully at all times. Cyclists like pedestrians are vulnerable. You will notice that people that cycle a lot, like for example in races or out on um, the back streets to try to get in their riding, those riders will obey the rules of the road. Um, however, just like in cities where people ride recreationally, they don't typically follow the rules, so just be aware that they are quite unpredictable as well. 
You want to be especially careful near children on bicycles. Children are used to adults watching out for them, so they tend to be unaware of danger. They also have poor peripheral vision and often find it hard to judge the speed and distance of an oncoming vehicle. They may not know the traffic rules or how much room it takes vehicles to stop. So C, we're going to shoulder check. Shoulder checking is important because riders and bicycles are narrow and can be easily hidden in your blind spot. Make sure you shoulder check before you open your door to get out of your vehicle. Check your side mirror as well. One of the most common causes of crashes involving cyclists is a driver who swings their door open without checking. Um, I actually believe in Vancouver that there is now a fine if you open your vehicle door without checking because this was happening very often as there are more cyclists in Vancouver. You also want to shoulder check before you pull away from the curve. Move to the right and we're going to pay extra attention at night. Observe carefully, especially for vehicles coming, sorry, bicycles coming from side streets. Some cyclists may not have lights, reflectors, or reflector gear. Be careful when passing. Before you pass another vehicle, make sure that you've checked for oncoming cyclists and cyclists in front of the vehicles that you are passing. When you scan at intersections, you want to be especially careful to shoulder check for vehicles, sorry, bicycles turning right. Watch out for cyclists ahead waiting to turn left if you're driving straight through. Check carefully for oncoming cyclists before making a left turn. Check carefully for cyclists crossing the road when coming to a place where bicycle trails meet the road. And be aware that the cyclist riding along the through road could be approaching faster than you think. Um, cyclists can actually go quite fast depending on um, how experienced they are. So this uh, is definitely key. Um, again, some cyclists just ride on the sidewalks, whereas others will ride directly on the road. So think. Know the rules. The cyclist follows the same rules and regulations as drivers, so you want to yield to cyclists as you would any other vehicle. If you have the right of way at an intersection, proceed if it's safe. A cyclist will expect you to follow the rules of the road. Be aware that the cyclist doesn't always stay on the right. To make a left turn, for example, they need to move over to the left lane. If the lane is narrow or if there's glass or a pothole on the right, a cyclist has the right to move out into the middle for safety. Pay attention to the bicycle lanes. For more information on these lanes, see Chapter 4, Rules of the Road. So do. We always want to allow good safe space margins and follow at a good distance. We want to allow plenty of following distance to avoid a hitting a cyclist who falls. Cyclists who wobble are probably inexperienced and more likely to fall than experienced cyclists. Give them even more space than usual. I think that I was talking about this before when it came up and I just try to give as much space as I possibly can. So like I said, when you're driving um, here in BC, you're going to be on the left side of the road anyways. So I just try to hug the line as much as I can. If I don't think that's going to be enough space and there's no oncoming traffic, I'm even going to go into that other lane just to, you know, avoid any possible issues. If it's safe to go over the line, um, I think that it's probably safer to do that than go too close to a cyclist, especially since you're not sure how experienced they are. We want to allow side margins. A significant number of crashes involving cyclists result from side swiping. Make sure there's enough space if you want to pass a cyclist. On a narrow road, wait for a clear, straight stretch that will allow you to pull out and give the cyclist some room. Remember, you're allowed to cross a single solid line when passing a cyclist, provided you can do so safely. On a multi-lane road, change the lanes rather than risking crowding the cyclist. So driving tip, even if you pull slightly into the other lane to pass, remember you are changing lanes. Remember to mirror check, signal, and shoulder check. Um, so yeah, I don't typically do this, but if you were going to do this in a road test, definitely want to do so. Um, but yeah, typically just hugging the yellow line does give that extra room unless you have quite a wide car. Always check your side margin when passing the cyclist. Communication. We want to recognize hand signals. So those are those hand signals that we do perform at the beginning of our test, but those are actually the hand signals that bicyclists are gonna use all the time because they don't typically have blinkers built onto their bikes. So we want to recognize those hand signals and understand that the hand signals that cyclists use. So cyclists may signal a right turn by extending their right arm straight out. And um, for their left turn, they're going to put their left arm straight out. Or they may also do um, 
the other ones that we do in the car. And for stopping, some cyclists will also do the stop signal. So it just depends on how experienced they are and how um, well-versed they are in the signs of the road as well. Um, with cyclists, I think making eye contact is probably your best form of communication if you can make eye contact with them. Um, just because your face, like it's very easy to see their eyes, right? So they're anticipating your move, you're anticipating their move, more than likely you're gonna make eye contact regardless. Uh, you don't want to honk your horn just because they're not inside their car so your horn honk is going to be real loud and that's probably going to scare them more so than help them um, and you don't want them to fall and ahead of you as well right so strategies for being a safe cyclist if you're a cyclist you're responsible for sharing the road in a way that keeps you and others safe so be predictable cyclists are more predictable if they follow the rules of the road be visible. Because bicycles are narrow, you need to work at making yourself visible. Wear bright or reflective clothing, especially in the dark or poor weather conditions. Position yourself so that other drivers can see you and avoid riding in blind spots. You want to ride defensively. Think and look well ahead. Be assertive, but remember that conflicts between a cyclist and a motor vehicle usually results in injury to the cyclist. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure how many people here would actually be cyclists themselves, but just, yeah, be aware that a lot of road drivers can um, get road rage and the cyclist is just an easy target. I do know a few people that have been hit as cyclists, so I wouldn't recommend um, being aggressive as a cyclist rider. <laughs> In, in BC, we want to also wear a bicycle helmet. If you ride at night, your bicycle must be equipped with the front white headlight visible at 150 meters and have rear red lights and a rear red reflector. Um, again, this is just for your safety. It's not for punishment. It's just very difficult to see bicycles at night as you will see as a new driver. Motorcycle riders. Like cyclists, motorcycle riders are vulnerable road users. They don't have the protection of an external frame, airbags, or bumpers, and are sometimes difficult to see. More than half of motorcycle vehicle crashes result in injury or death. So we want to watch for clues. Sometimes the motorcycle's turn signals are hard to see. Watch the rider for clues. If the rider shoulder checks on the motorcycle leans, the rider is probably turning, planning to change lanes or turn. Uh, motorcycles are a little bit easier to see than bikes just because they are bigger and they do have signal lights. Um, however, you'll notice that they usually ride on one side. So they either ride on the, can't remember, the right or the left side. I think that they can choose and that just helps to make them more visible as well. Um, but yeah, definitely be careful of those motorcyclists because they are more vulnerable. We want to look carefully for bikes and motorbikes when we drive through intersections. Without good observation skills, the driver of the blue car might miss seeing the motorcycle. So yeah, he's just coming up. He's not expecting a motorcyclist, so he may not see this motorcyclist here. And if he tries to just ram through, who knows, um, the motorcyclist could also not see him because this car is quite large and just kind of in the way. We want to scan at mo intersections and look carefully for motorcycles when you come into an intersection. When you are turning left, look out for oncoming motorcycles. Motorcycles can be hard to see, especially at night, at dusk, or in heavy traffic. It is also difficult to judge how fast they are approaching. When you are driving through an intersection, watch for an oncoming motorcycle that may be turning left. In BC, you don't really see motorcyclists unless it's during the summer, just because um, it rains a lot here in BC. So it's not typically great to drive in the rain as a motorcyclist. Um, so mostly that's gonna be like the May to September um, that you're gonna be looking for these people. Space margins. We wanna allow side margins again, just like we would with a bike. Never try to share a lane with a motorcycle. The motorcycle needs the whole lane to travel safely. Again, if there's potholes or gravel, those motorcyclists need that room to be able to shift throughout the lane. We also wanna avoid a safe following distance. Allow at least three seconds of following distance when you're following a motorcycle because motorcycles can stop very quickly. Motorcyclists can skid and fall because of poor road conditions and you need to leave them plenty of room. Well, you need to leave yourself plenty of room to stop safely if that were to happen. You want to allow space when passing, allow plenty of space to pass a motorcycle. Your vehicle may throw dirt or water into the rider's face. 
Um, I don't like to ride behind motorcyclists, so I'll typically try to pass them at the safest point possible just because, yeah, I don't want them to fall in front of myself and it can be quite difficult to judge their speed. Communication. You want to make eye contact, establish good eye contact whenever possible. Uh, making eye contact with a motorcyclist is a little more difficult because they typically have that full face mask, which can make it difficult for yourself to see if they are looking at you. But again, eye contact is usually the best way of communication if you can make it with that person because then you know that you've seen each other. You also want to read the vehicle language. Don't assume that a rider in the left part of the lane is planning to turn left. Motorcycles often ride in the left part of the lane to make themselves more visible. So this is just what I was saying. They typically ride um, on that one side of the lane just to make themselves more visible to different vehicles. Passenger vehicles. As you drive, you will interact with the drivers of cars, vans, or small trucks. Drivers of passenger vehicles can be just as unpredictable as other road users. They may not always look ahead. Their vehicle may not be well maintained. For example, their brakes or signal lights may not be working properly. And some drivers may be tired, impatient, or impaired. Use all your see, think, do skills to observe and respond safely to other passenger vehicles. Large vehicles. So we kind of um, touched on this in the past. Large vehicles operate quite diff differently than cars. We want to give them lots of room. So with space margins, always allow following distance. A big vehicle can prevent you from seeing the hazards ahead. You will have a wider range of vision if you increase your following space. So yeah, so if you increase your following space, you'll be able to see their um, side mirrors. That's typically the distance that you want to have because if you can't see their mirrors, they can't see you. And also by giving yourself that extra space, you can typically see a little bit ahead of them um, or at least would you, you would have time to stop if you were to have to slam on your brakes. If you're stopped facing uphill behind a large vehicle, remember that they may roll backwards when the driver releases the brakes. Um, so we wanna leave extra space in front of our vehicle. So yeah, large vehicles, they typically have different brakes than passenger vehicles just because they do have a lot more weight. So you definitely wanna leave extra space um, when you're behind them. In rainy weather, large vehicles can spray dirt or water onto your windshield, reducing your vision. Their tires may also spray up rocks that will hit your vehicle. Staying well behind will keep will prevent this. Um, so driving on a highway, always be aware of like dump trucks or large vehicles because getting a rock in your windshield is a real problem. <laughs> My friend commutes to Burnaby um, every day for work and she has many um, little rocks on her window and myself was um, commuting to Vancouver recently and I think I have like four now. So yeah, you definitely want to keep back if possible. So this sign here, you will see this sign on the back of some vehicles. It's used to indicate that vehicles will be moving slowly. Keep your distance and pass only when you're certain that it's safe. This is a different one. When you see this sign or a wide load or a long load or an oversized um, load sign on a truck or pilot car, it indicates an oversized load is being transported. So you'll see um, most times when there's a wide load, there is an extra car that either drives, it usually drives behind and it has those flashing yellow lights that say oversized um, load. So it's quite easy to see, um, but otherwise you're just gonna have this bar across the bottom of their bumper. So this is just indicating the blind spots that trucks have here. So see how this whole side is a blind spot, this whole side is a blind spot, and behind them is a blind spot, and in front. <laughs> so you want to be really careful of these vehicles because it's not even necessarily their own fault. It's just the fact that they do have so many blind spots that people can get lost in. We want to keep clear of them. We want to um, make sure that we keep out of them, otherwise the driver will not see us, and we should be able to see both, si both mirrors of the truck or bus in front of you. Never try to sneak behind a truck if it is backing in, in or out of a loading bay or driveway. You will either hit one of the driving blind spots and risk being hit. Sorry, that was a weird sentence. Um, another thing to notice is sometimes people will pull in front of trucks like on the highway or before you come to a stoplight. Be aware that trucks need a longer space to stop. And so you should not be trying to cut into the space here unless there's ample room for you to stop as well because you're just risking the chance of being hit. 
as trucks often take longer to stop depending on what they have in the back here. If it's empty, you're safe, but it, you never know if it's empty or full. And it's just a good practice not to go directly in front of a large truck like this. So yeah, we want to be aware if the driver can see us and we want to avoid that blind spot. Um, we want to allow space when we're passing. You need a lot of space when you're passing. Remember, trucks are long. Some pull two or some even pull two trailers. So you don't want to pass unless you have enough space. If you pass a large vehicle or make a lane change in front of a big one, remember that big vehicles take longer to slow down. Make sure that you can see the truck's headlights in your rearview mirror before you re-enter the lane and maintain your speed once you get there. If you see a truck starting to slow down well before a red light, remember that the driver uses all of that space in order to stop in time. Never move into that space or you could be rear-ended. So yeah, just what I was saying. Don't pull in front of them um, just because they do need that space. Make room for wide turns. Big vehicles need a lot of room to turn and when they turn you may be squeezed onto maybe squeeze between the truck and the curb so yeah you'll typically see this they'll pull like they're going to turn left but then they turn right and that's just because they do need that extra space um, so if you do see a truck with their turn signal on typically i just wait at the back until i figure out what they're doing um, or sometimes if they're backing out i mean you may not want to give them space but at the end of the day that is your car and you are the one at risk so it is better just to give the right of way to big trucks because um, you're never gonna win against a truck essentially. So you may have a space problem if you are in the road that a large vehicle is turning onto. The driver may need to cross the center line or cut a corner in order to keep that turn. Again, keep your distance. Um, so if I'm this car and this person's coming and there is no one behind me, I'm just gonna back up until I feel safe. Um, because again, you don't know how, how experienced this truck driver is. Perhaps it is their first couple of years driving, so they may not know their own space margins. So if you have the room and you were this red car, I would just back up a little bit more. Typically, if I was say the car behind the red car and I saw this happening, I would still reverse if I could so that I would give that car an extra room. Another option would be for this red car to pull closer to this curb so that the truck does have that extra room as well. Again, seems inconvenient, but it's all about your safety at the end of the day. Driving tip. Many of the back roads of BC are lo logging roads. We wanna observe carefully if you're driving on one of these roads. Turn on your headlights for maximum visibility. If your vehicle doesn't have daytime running lights, be especially cautious when approaching a curve or a hill. Always yield to logging trucks. Um, yeah, so if you're in northern BC, you're definitely going to see a lot of logging trucks. Typically in the city, you're not going to see them. Um, they're a bit scarier just because you can see how many logs that they have on that truck. <laughs> so you're typically automatically going to give that extra room because it is definitely a lot when you're staring at a huge truck of logs. We want to, be a, we want to avoid being on the right of a large vehicle if there's a chance it may turn right. So yeah, just like it says, don't go up there. Um, just wait your turn. We want to avoid turbulence. Big vehicles create turbulence that can push you away from the vehicle or pull you towards it. Turbulence can cause problems if you're passing a big truck or when you're coming or when you meet one coming towards you. Allow a lot of space on the side and keep a firm grip on the steering wheel. So when you are driving on the highway, um, this can happen. When a big truck goes past you or you pass a big truck, you'll kind of feel your car moving to that. If you have a bigger or like more established vehicle, you may not feel it. Um, myself, I have a smaller car. I definitely feel it every time I pass a truck. Communication, read vehicle language. Many large vehicles are equipped with engine retarders that slow the vehicle down without the use of a brake. Truck drivers also use their gears to slow down. This means that a truck or bus ahead of you could slow down without using the brake lights. Look ahead and listen for the change in a truck's engine noise. Um, yeah, so I feel like you're not going to hear the change in the engine noise. So just be aware um, if you see that space decreasing that they're obviously slowing down and just to slow down and maintain your speed with them. Watch for signs that a larger vehicle is about to back up. A horn, a beeper, or a four-way flasher, or backup lights. Typically, it's pretty obvious oops, when a truck is going to back up, 
um, because I believe they have like automatic beepers put in. And if they think that they can't see, you'll notice that some truck drivers will honk as well as they back up very slowly. Um, again, if you're behind them, <laughs> you definitely want to get out of the way because that is one of their blind spots. You want to signal well ahead. If you're ahead of a large vehicle, signal well before you slow down, turn, or stop, just because they do need that extra time to slow down. We're almost done this chapter. It's quite quite a shorter chapter, which is nice, <laughs> considering the last, I think, three have been like an hour. So this is about school buses. Um, so here in BC, school buses always have right of way as well. I believe they're now equipped with cameras so that if you do try to pass them when they're stopped, um, you are going to get a fine. So just be aware that, yeah, school buses like pedestrians always have right of way. We're going to watch for clues. So a school bus that's stopped to let children out has these lights here at the top that typically flash. And then they also typically have a stop sign that comes out, um, I believe on both sides so that it's more obvious. The school bus driver may have turned on the alternating amber lights when preparing to stop. So there's um, sometimes signs here if it's a place where they are usually stopping, so such as in front of a school or if it's a neighborhood route. You may stop in either direction, you must stop in either direction whenever you see these flashing lights. So yes, you're stopping if you're behind them, but you're also stopping if you're on the other side just because children may be crossing in front. Um, if the children are crossing in front, typically the school bus driver will get out as well. Uh, depending on how old the children are. But yeah, so when I say no passing, I mean like you can't pass on either side. Everybody has to stop until the school bus regains speed. And um, yeah, otherwise you're looking at that fine. And also, of course, children's safety. <laughs> I always drive safer when I think children are around just because like the book says, children are quite unpredictable and they don't always follow the rules. So we want to know the rules. When you see a school bus with alternating flashing lights it, on the top, you must stop whether you are in approaching lanes or in the um, front. So just either way, you're going to be stopped. After stopping for a school bus, do not start moving again until the bus moves or the driver signals that it's safe by turning off the lights and pulling in the stop signs. So yeah, nobody moves until the bus moves. So public transit, we're going to see, we're going to look for buses that have stopped. They might block your view of pedestrians about to cross the street and they may pull into traffic. Um, so typically pedestrians aren't supposed to run across in front of buses, but I have seen that at like malls or different things like that. So it's not always a great idea to pass buses, but I know that you will see a lot of people passing buses quite aggressively, um, especially on Fraser Highway, kind of in my area here. <laughs> so we want to think Know the rules, you must allow a public transit bus that is signaling and displaying a yield to bus sign to move out from the curb or a bus stop. This rule applies to all roads where the speed is 60 kilometers or lower. Um, so yeah, so sometimes buses, they'll have their own like little uh, drive-in loop that they can drive into and unload their passengers. That is a bit safer because then you have room to pass until they come back in. We want to allow good speed margins um, to, and we can change our lane to let the bus pull out if there is space in the next lane or slow down if you can't change lanes safely. Um, so yeah, just like a regular car pulling out into traffic, however, they do have that right of way just because they are a multi-passenger vehicle. Emergency vehicles, um, these include police cars, ambulances, and fire trucks. We want to they see, so we want to listen for their sirens and watch for those flashing lights. Sometimes you'll hear honking if they think that um, passengers haven't been, or sorry, other drivers haven't seen them. So we want to look and see where the vehicle is coming from. And then once the vehicle is passed, we want to watch and listen because there may be others. Typically in BC, we have the fire truck, um, the ambulance, and then the police, usually in that order. It just depends where the crash is closer to. So we want to think, we want to know the rules. Emergency vehicles displaying a flashing light and siren always have right of way. All traffic moving in both directions must stop. However, if you are on a divided highway where the emergency vehicle is coming on the other side of the median, you may not need to stop. <coughs> the reason that both sides of the traffic do stop is so that that 
emergency vehicle does have the option to go into the other lane. So this is what, what this is just saying is if you're on Highway 1, for example, and there's no way it could come into your lane to make their life easier, in that case, you don't need to stop, right? Because your stopping and moving is just pointless at that point. Whereas if you were on just like a regular solid line or double solid line, it may be useful because then they can just slide into your lane to clear other drivers. <coughs> so we wanna clear the path. We don't wanna block the path of an emergency vehicle. Usually the best thing is to pull over to the right and stop or to the left if you're driving the left lane of a divided highway or in a one-way street. Do not stop in an intersection. So if you can't pull to the right or left, depending on where you are in that intersection, you just wanna turn and then um, recalibrate your GPS after, because at the end of the day, that emergency vehicle has to go somewhere fast. And if it means you have to go around the block, that's not really the end of the world. And you can do that more so than they can stop and try to wait for you to move. So yeah, if you hear the emergency vehicles thing, now you wanna quickly think and see where you should go to make it um, more convenient for them. So it's illegal to drive over a fire hose. I didn't know that till just now. Um, typically, I don't think that's really gonna come across you um, driving because I've never even had to drive over a fire hose, but now you know, it's illegal. <laughs> Driving tip. If you're stopped in an intersection, you are blocking the path of an emergency vehicle, you may have to turn the corner to the other way. So yeah, this is just what I was saying. You may need to turn even though you didn't want to turn um, just to clear that path. So, oh, so this is a better visual. So see how there is just the line? We're going to pull over so that if this person needs to pass this person because they didn't move, they can just pull into this lane and safely continue. So as long as everybody kind of does their part, it's fairly easy. Even while I was on a full highway, I saw like all of the lanes of traffic move and that emergency vehicle was able to get through. So just being aware of your surroundings. So all vehicles on the road must pull over to leave a clear path whenever an emergency vehicle uses the sirens and flashing lights. So we wanna allow a following distance. When you're following a fire truck, you must stay back at least 150 meters and you want to signal so that your emergency vehicle knows that you have seen them and are pulling over. Stopped vehicles with flashing lights. Drivers may, must slow down and leave plenty of room when passing stopped vehicles displaying flashing lights to make other highways safer for law enforcement, emergency personnel, and other roadside workers. This rule applies to all vehicles authorized to display flashing yellow, red, white, or blue lights, including those used by fire departments, law enforcement, commercial vehicle inspectors, conservation officers, paramedics, tow truck operators, highway maintenance workers, utility workers, land surveyors, animal control workers, and garbage collectors. Um, so yeah, so if you see this uh, sign or the flashing lights, you just want to, um, slow down and leave plenty of room. So fast back, failure to change lanes and or slow down when passing stop vehicles displaying flashing lights may result in a traffic violation and penalty points. So basically if a cop sees you do this, like passing someone fast without space, they can ticket you. Um, this is just because say that person was gonna get out of their truck and you haven't left room for them, that could result in injury or possibly vehicle damage. Obviously they're stopped for a reason and we are passing them so we can leave extra space. We wanna know the rules. All traffic must slow down when approaching these vehicles displaying the flashing lights. When approaching these types of vehicles, you must drive no faster than 70 kilometers, even if the speed is 80 kilometers or more. No faster than 40 kilometers, even if the speed is less than 80 kilometers. Exception, this rule does not apply if you're on a divided highway or approaching the vehicle with flashing lights from the opposite direction. So again, if you're not in the way, then you don't have to slow down. If you are in the lane nearest to the stop vehicle displaying the flashing lights, you must also change lanes if safe to do so. So if nobody's in that other lane, just move lanes and that makes it easier for everyone. Space margins and speed control. You wanna slow down and leave space when passing vehicles with flashing lights on the side of roads. Change lanes to, okay, so that's basically just the same sentence we just read, but yes, change lanes and provide safe space margins if it is safe to do so. 
construction zones. So this is um, definitely one you want to pay attention of. Here in BC, we have a lot of construction. So road crews work throughout the year to maintain and improve our roads. Despite construction zones, signs, traffic control people, crashes still occur in these construction zones, mainly because drivers don't pay attention. So we want to see, scan ahead, look for construction zones, and be prepared to obey traffic control devices within the zone. We want to pay attention at night. Road construction doesn't just occur in the daytime. With high daytime traffic volumes, more and more road construction takes place at night. You need to pay extra attention and drive extra slowly through construction zones at night. That's just because reduced visibility, right? Um, usually uh, construction workers are going to be use wearing those high vis, but if you're not paying attention, um, could pop out of a hole or something, you wouldn't see them. But there's typically a lot of signs, especially if they're working at night, there's those flashing lights that will give you a clue as well. We want to look around. Just because you don't immediately see a traffic control person, construction, or workers in the construction zone does not mean that they're not there. Be alert for traffic control persons, construction workers, and equipment. Um, so yeah, even those um, excavators come rolling out of nowhere sometimes. So you want to know the rules. You must obey the directions of a traffic control person and construction signs from the start to the end of the construction zone. So that's kind of like a school zone, right? So we're going to pay attention to the when the sign starts and when the sign ends. And these speed limits apply 24 hours a day when posted. And they're also heavily policed. So if you are breaking this construction speed zone, I believe the ticket is three times the amount that you would get usually, or it's, it's quite high because you shouldn't be speeding in these construction zones just because there are a lot of workers and those workers are just as vulnerable as pedestrians as they don't have very much equipment other than their helmet. So we want to think ahead. Construction zones often require lane closures, so you may need to change lanes. Merge to avoid traffic or merge to avoid lane closures as soon as you can because it help, will help maintain the traffic flow. We want to plan ahead, expect delays, plan for them leaving by leaving early to reach your destination on time. Construction crews aren't there personally to inconvenience you. They are improving the roads for everyone. So we want to check your radio, television, websites for the latest traffic reports and updates to find out what's happening on the roads in your area along your intended route. Consider taking an alternate route. Um, so if you are working far away, for example, if I'm going to be working like half an hour or 45 minutes away, I'm just going to check my GPS before I head out to make sure that there's nothing that I could have missed, like construction or an accident or anything like that. And um, yeah, take an alternate route if you have to, um, especially if you're running late. Driving tip. Unnecessary idling wastes gas and causes emissions that degrade the air quality and contribute to climate. Um, change. If you are directed to stop at a construction zone, turn off the engine. Idling for more than 10 seconds costs more than turning the engine off. So typically if you're going to be stopped for a while and you notice that you were stopped for a while before um, or they just like tell you or you notice other road drivers, you can just turn off your car. Um, again, you just want to be aware that you're actually stopping for a while. <laughs> Otherwise, it can take more time to turn off and on your car. Um, but yeah, here it says more than 10 seconds in your wasted gas, I guess. So we want to slow down. Road services may be uneven or unpaved, so you will need to slow down. You must obey the construction zone time limits. Traffic fines, here we are. Traffic fines are double within construction zones. Um, again, that's just the basic one. If you <laughs> make the cop upset, it could be more so, so you just don't even want to risk it at that point. We want to stop and direct it. Um, so typically you'll see those traffic people with the stop or slow signs. If they're showing you the stop, you must stop. And um, in some other construction zones, you may need to wait for a pilot car to escort you through the work zone. Uh, this is kind of very rare. I don't think I've ever had to follow a pilot car. But if it was on a bigger highway, maybe the sea to sky, that could possibly be a thing because I know that their construction be can be quite long at times. We want to allow following distance and leave plenty of room and following distance between your vehicle and the vehicle ahead. Avoid changing lanes in a construction zone. They're typically just one lane to avoid that problem. 
You're also going to allow space margins. So you want to leave space between you and the construction crews and their equipment in the construction zones. So for example, if they're on your left side, you're going to try to leave more room on your left. If they're on your right side, you're going to try to leave more room on your right. That's just because it allows more safety room, right? Trains. So this is actually one of my questions that I failed on my learner test <laughs> the first time and I was so upset because um, I just thought trains were super obvious. So each year people die or seriously injured in collisions between vehicles and trains. So you need to be careful when approaching a railway crossing. Most trains require approximately two kilometers to stop. Never try to beat one. Uh, so I did date a train um, engineer at one point, and this is true. They do do their own like safety tests where they try to stop right away. But when you do have a train, that's a lot of uh, weight and equipment, and they typically can't stop. Even if they wanted to stop, there's just no way. So you don't want to race a train because at the end of the day, you're not going to win, and there's nothing they can do about it either. So we're gonna watch for the clues. There's lots of clues that warn you of a railway crossing ahead. So there's typically an advanced warning sign. These signs alert you to an upcoming crossing and tell you to look, listen, and slow down because you may have to stop. They're usually posted in locations where you can't see an upcoming railway crossing. For example, a hilly or curvy road. An advisory speed limit is posted below the advanced warning sign may show you the safe road speed is less than the posted speed. Um, so typically just when you go around the corners or when you're coming up to things like this, um, it will give like an advised speed. And the advised speed is just to let you know that there's a possibility that you'll need to stop. And as a new driver, you definitely want to follow those. Um, otherwise you can damage your car just because those signs are made for your, your safety and your car's safety. It's not just for fun. So pavement markings at a point um, where you're approaching the railway crossing, you may see this X painted on the pavement. Some crossings also have flashing lights, a bell, and gates. If the light and bell are activated or the gate is down, it means the train is approaching. So you may not be able to see the train coming if the visibility is poor, but you may hear its whistle. But remember, trains are not required to sound a whistle at every crossing. Um, so again, they don't actually have to whistle at every crossing. It's more so the train engineer's um, own preference. Uh, some they do have to do, but some they don't. And then also at night, they don't usually use their whistle just because it does wake up people. So just, I wouldn't rely on the whistle. I would rely more so on the, the road markings and such, and also by looking. So you want to observe carefully. Be aware that your eyes may mislead you. Trains often seem to be traveling much slower than they actually are. Passenger trains travel up to 160 kilometers in an hour in Canada. Be especially careful at night. Half of the, all the nighttime collisions between trains and cars involve vehicles hitting the side of the train because the driver didn't see it. So this is the question I got wrong in the test. It asked if the collisions between trains and cars were either because the car didn't see the train or the train didn't see the car. And I was thinking that obviously you would always see the train, but um, if a lot of road users, they are relying heavily on those signs and flashing lights. And if that, those aren't going or they're trying to run the train, they will miss seeing the train completely because trains are typically black or brown, or sometimes they do have like the red engine. So just be aware if you are crossing a train crossing that you are looking for a train because like I said, they can't stop if they see you regardless. So check for other road users. Want to watch out for other road users at railway crossings. Motorcycle riders and cyclists may have to swerve to cross the tracks safely. They could slip and fall on wet tracks, so be careful to cover your brake and leave extra room. Um, yeah, so motorcycle riders and cyclists, just because bikes aren't as sturdy their wheels, um, they may have to take the train tracks in a weird way. So you just want to leave them extra room just in case they do slip. Um, warning, expect a train on track at any time. Trains don't always follow regular schedules. And also when there's a red traffic light at an intersection on the other side of the railway crossing, do not stop on the tracks. Stop before the railway crossing unless there is room on the other side. 
So yeah, never, ever, ever, ever stop on a train track just because, um, say, the light turns red or someone stops behind you. Now you can't move off that track. And if a train does come, you don't really have anywhere to go. So you never want to stop on the tracks just for your own safety. You want to watch for second trains as well. Be aware that there's often more than one track, so watch out for a second train. One of the main causes of car and train crashes is that the driver doesn't wait for the second train that is hidden behind the first one. So think, we wanna know the rules. Trains always have the right of way. They don't slow down for crossings. If there is a gate down, you must stop and wait for it to go up before you cross the tracks. If flashing red lights are displayed on the crossing, you must stop, move across the tracks only when it's safe, or if a flag person directs you to stop, you must also obey their directions. If you hear or see a train approaching the crossing, stop and don't proceed until it's safe. We want to think ahead. If your vehicle is stuck on the track, you will have to think and act quickly. Get all passengers out of the vehicle and move at least 30 meters away from the track to avoid flying debris. Then phone for help. Transport Canada. Look for the phone number on the back of the railway crossing signs. 911 or the local police. Report the location that's on the back of the railroad crossing sign. So again, save yourself the hassle. Don't stop on the tracks because this could happen very easily. We want to stop no closer than five meters and no further than 15 meters from the farthest rail. So typically where the stop line is, that's where you want to stop. Just otherwise you're going to hit that turbulence from the train and it's just not safe. Speed control. We're going to drive at a safe speed. We should also always be able to stop within the distance lit by your headlights if you're driving at night. We want to gear down if you're driving a vehicle with standard crossing or standard transmission. Change to a lower gear before you begin to cross. Never change gears in the crossing because you could stall your vehicle. So yeah, don't change gears when you're crossing, um, just like you wouldn't stop on a track. And then allow a safe following distance. Never get trapped on a crossing. When traffic is heavy, wait until you can clear the crossing before moving ahead. Horses. Horses may be ridden on most public roads. We want to scan ahead, look for horses and riders. We want to know the rules. Horse riders and horse carriage operators have the same rights as a motor vehicle operator and must obey the same rules. But just be aware that horses can be startled by sudden movement or a noise and the rider may not be able to control the horse um, so yeah never ever honk when you're around a horse also always give like a good space barge in and try to go slow because you don't want to startle the horse that's not safe for you the horse or the rider so we're going to slow down go slowly when approaching a horse a rider or a carriage allow plenty of following distance we're going to allow space when we're passing them and leave extra room when we're passing them and we're going to pass carefully because the horses may be startled by sudden movement or a noise. Avoid your horn and pass carefully and slowly. And we're also going to prepare to stop if we see anything going on. If you see the rider moving weird or it looks like they're having trouble controlling their horse, it's better just to stop and wait until the horse is back under the rider's control than to risk passing them. Again, your safety, their safety. And that's the end of chapter six. I thought it was going to be shorter and it wasn't really. So I'm sorry if that disappointed you because it also disappointed me. Um, but we only have four more chapters to go. I'm going to try to get them out right away because it sounds like people are actually um, using these videos. And of course, I want you to get the best use out of them. All right. Have a great day.